Hello everyone and welcome to Rolling on the Riviera, which is the TTG Riviera Fest session dedicated to river cruise itineraries. Big welcome back to Will, Head of Product for Cruising in Longhaunt Riviera. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. And so what's coming up today in this session? We're going to talk through all the wonderful river cruise itineraries that clients can choose from when they travel with Riviera. That includes which rivers they can explore, what themed itineraries and festive cruises look like, as well as which sailings will recommend for different seasons. We're also going to touch on cruises for solo travellers and what makes them great for this lucrative market. If you have any questions for Will, please do pop them in the chat box, as always, during these sessions, and we will leave time for a Q&A at the end. So, Will, launching into the questions, uh, how do you categorise your river cruise itineraries first? Um, and, and depending on how you categorise them, why have you decided to group them that way? Sure. So the, the bulk of our itineraries are what we call our classic itineraries. So they're just the, the, the classic itineraries that you're used to, that uh, are the sort of mainstream kind of things. And then we've also got our themed itineraries, which we'll probably come on to a little bit later on. Uh, we launched those uh, in December last year, so fa fairly new for us. Um, really interesting way of, of seeing the rivers in a slightly different way. Then we have our festive itineraries, which, as the name suggests, they're all, all based around uh, December and, and feeling nice and uh, uh, Christmassy. And then we have our solo itineraries, which, again, we're going to come on to. Uh, they're dedicated for solo travellers. And finally, uh, our most recent one is our combination cruises, which we launched uh, only about a couple of months ago. So still quite a new thing for us here, but uh, very exciting. And then in terms of why we've categorized them like that, it's just a natural evolution of the way that our, our business has gone. So we started off with the classic mainstream ones. And then as, we, as we've responded to uh, customer demand and suggestions, we, we've brought in new things. And so that's just the way that uh, things have evolved for us. Okay, great. And I've noticed on your website, you've, you've grouped them as European river cruises and worldwide river cruises as well. So, so first, tell us about the European river cruise itineraries and which rivers are you operating on? So we operate on all of the major European uh, rivers. So that's the Douro in Portugal, the Danube, which goes through Austria, Hungary and Slovakia. And then we have our two French rivers. So the Rhone in the south and the Seine in the north. And then the uh, the Rhine in Germany and the Moselle. And then that uh, also branches onto the Main Canal as well. So that's basically all the major waterways uh, throughout Europe that we cover. Amazing. And what would you say is your, excuse me, <clears throat> is your best selling European river cruise? Um, and, and what do you think makes it so popular? So we've probably got two that are bigger than all the rest. And so the first one is the Douro. Mm -hmm. And I think things that people like about that are uh, there's some really interesting scenery along the way going through the vineyards as you cruise through. So re really, really picturesque. Of course, the wine in Portugal is a really big hit with customers. So Portugal's got some of the best wines in Europe, in my opinion, and, and in a lot of people's opinion, actually. Um, as well as that, you, I think you tend to get slightly better weather in, in Portugal. And so people associate it with sunshine. So sitting out on the sun deck and just watching the world go by. So I think all of those things combined make it, make it a really popular option for our customers. I think the other most popular item we have is the Danube. Now, I think the thing that really draws people in with this is it's a chance to see three of Europe's big capital cities in one go. So you've got Budapest in Hungary, Vienna in Austria and Bratislava in Slovakia. So seeing those three capital cities all in one week, as well as some really other uh, interesting other things as well. We've got uh, the, the Vakal Valley, which is, again, really, really gorgeous scenery and some hidden gems that you've probably not heard of. But they're the things that you're probably going to be telling your friends about when you get home. OK, amazing. And, and which which cruise would you say is the most underrated in Europe? <laughs> Interesting question. That's a really good question. I think um, the, the Seine is a really underrated cruise because I think a lot of people think of it as just being quite a, about Paris. And of course, we all know Paris and, you know, it's obviously a, a big destination and a huge hit for all its uh, all, all the reasons that we already know about. But the Seine River, as it, as it winds its way northwest through France, it's absolutely full of incredible destinations that I don't think people really think about when they think about the Seine Cruise. So you've got destinations such as Rouen, which is honestly one of my favourite towns on the rivers. Uh, the Enfleur, absolutely picture perfect seaside town on, on the coast there. You, we get to visit Monet's Garden, where you get to see the famous water lilies pond. So as well as Paris, you've got all these other great things that I think people don't necessarily realise. Okay, great. 
And now I did just want to run through kind of those rivers and, and which destinations you're visiting on each of them um, and the high, kind of the highlights of those itineraries. So I know you've mentioned a few already, but should we start with the Danube um, and talk just talk through the destinations there? Yeah. So as I mentioned, the, the, the big destinations there are Budapest, the, the capital of Hungary, absolutely stunning city split in half across the river, Buda on one side, Pest on the other, absolutely full of history. Uh, there's some really, really fascinating destinations there. The Castle District is, is really beautiful. Incredible views out across the city from there as well. And then we've got Vienna, you know, one of the big imperial capitals uh, in Europe. So, again, full of history. The architecture there is absolutely gorgeous. Every street you walk around is, is just like a, a, a new postcard waiting to be made. Uh, and then we've got Bratislava, probably the, the least well-known of, of the three capitals, but it's really, really fantastic in its own right. It's a lot smaller than the others, which makes it so much easier to get around in, in the time you've got. You, you know, you really feel like you've done a lot of that. And again, fascinating history in all of these places. As well as those places, you've got the, the, the hidden gems, as we like to call them. So you've got places like uh, Eshtagon, uh, which has got an absolutely stunning basilica that our guests always rave about when they get home. We've got Melk Abbey as well, which is uh, uh, in, in Austria. And uh, it's absolutely stunning abbey, uh, so well preserved. And just being in there, it's like walking back hundreds of years in time. So they're, they're the real sort of main uh, aspects of the cruise. But uh, I think one of the things that our, our guests get really excited about is the, the trip to Salzburg that we do. So although Salzburg isn't on the river, uh, we more in a place called Linz. And then from there, it's about an hour and a half up to Salzburg. And of course, Sound of Music, Mozart, all of that sort of stuff there. And uh, yeah, that's, that's a really, really great day out. Yeah, I can imagine that's very popular. <laughs> okay, so moving on to the Douro. Can you talk about destinations visited on those cruises? Sure. So we start off in Porto, um, which I, I'm probably in danger of saying that everywhere is my favourite, but Porto genuinely <laughs> is. Uh, I've been on a couple of city breaks to Porto and I absolutely love the place. It's so easy to, to just get straight into, enjoy it. It's got a really lovely atmosphere, musicians playing on the streets, lovely places to pick up a little tipple of port. Uh, again, amazing history. The views pretty much wherever you go in Porto are absolutely stunning. You can go up on, on top of the one, one of the big bridges and have views down the river. Honestly, it's, it's just a, a great way to start your, your cruise. From there, we wend our way up the river. And uh, at the top end of the river, we take an excursion to Salamanca in Spain across the border. And again, a really lovely city. It's full of history there. It's a really interesting town. It's a big university town as well. So it's uh, it's got that going for it. The, the university there is huge. Uh, there's some, uh, we, we go uh, to a really nice place for a tapas lunch as well to make sure that you're getting that real proper, authentic Spanish experience. So yeah, another really great day out there. And I think uh, one of the other things that our customers often point out that they love is we, we stop at uh, what they call quintas along the way, which is sort of like uh, uh, like farm stroke bar type places. They, they make their own wines, they make their own oils and vinegars. So it's a, it's a chance to stop off at these places. We take them for wine tastings, we take them for lunch, take them for dinner. So you feel like you're experiencing like real authentic Portugal. Fantastic. And how about the Moselle? The Moselle is, is probably the smallest uh, river that we uh, sail on. So uh, from that point of view, not very well known. But uh, one thing I can tell you about the Moselle is the wine around the Moselle is really, really good. There's lots of nice little places that you can go and they'll offer you a free wine tasting. There's places you can go and you know, fill your suitcase up to take some gifts back for the folks back home. And of course, the vineyards that uh, that you can visit along the way where all this wine is made. They're, they're picturesque uh, as well. So uh, I see the background behind you, I think, is probably Moselle by, by looking at it as well. So, <laughs> yeah, that's the sort of thing you can expect. Lots and lots of beautiful green space and cute little towns. Another thing I like about the Moselle is that we uh, visit Luxembourg uh, while we're on our um, Moselle cruises. Now, a real sort of underappreciated part of Europe. Not a lot of people know it. They probably hear about it in the Eurovision Song Contest, and, and that's about it. Uh, but uh, really interesting city, very, very sort of clean and, and, and very nicely kept city. So it's a real, real pleasure to walk around Luxembourg. I really like it. Fantastic. And next up on my list, we have the Rhine. The Rhine. Well, the thing that I always think of when I think of the Rhine is the Rhine Gorge, 
which is probably the most picturesque sailing that you can do in Europe. The, the steep uh, slopes that go up either side of the ship as, as you're sailing through, it's it's like, like nothing you've ever experienced before. I absolutely love it. And as you're sailing through this incredibly dramatic scenery, there's, there's castles upon the uh, on the hilltops, there's churches, there's tiny little towns, of course, the famous Lorelei statue, which uh, people always enjoy. And uh, as we sail past, we enjoy our, our Rudersheimer coffee, which is a, a rather boozy, creamy uh, version of a coffee that they have in that part of Germany. So that just really enhances the, uh, the experience as well. As well as all of that, I think uh, you, you can't not mention Cologne, which is, a, uh, a, again, a, a fabulous city, so full of history. The cathedral in Cologne, one of the biggest in the world. It was the biggest building in the world at one point, I do believe, as well. So, um, yeah, again, just a great place to go and have a look around. And then the other place that really sticks out for me on the on the Rhine is, is Rudersheim, which it, it just feels like the most chocolate box Rhine German town that you can imagine. It's all just very, very cute and lovely. And it just it, people there are so friendly. And it's yeah, just a, a really great town to, to uh, spend an afternoon. Fantastic. And not to be confused with the Rhine. What about the Rhone? Which destinations are you, are you visiting on that river? <laughs> yeah, definitely not to be confused because they're very different. <laughs> but, um, uh, our, our Rhone cruise starts off in Lyon, which uh, is a it's quite quite a large city. Uh, lots going for it. It's probably one of the uh, big culinary capitals of uh, France. So uh, lots of really nice places to go and try some things, get yourself a little macaron or you know another bottle of wine to take home. Uh, but also lots of really interesting history there. The Romans were there for a long time. The, you can go up to uh, the cathedral at Fourvière and have incredible views across the uh, the river from there. So a great place to start the cruise. And as we went our way down, one of the big uh, uh, things for our guests is the Ardèche Gorge. So vast, vast landscapes. Again, a little bit like the Rhine Gorge in that it's just, you know, not like anything you really see on, on a day-to-day -day basis. It really is beautiful, vast, you know, photos can never really do it justice. You just have to be there and just experience it. And uh, the cruise culminates in Avignon which is a beautiful little town. It's walled all around it, so it's got that real sort of medieval quality to it. Lots of nice squares where you can sit out and maybe enjoy a, a, a little coffee in the sunshine or whatever it may be, but a, a really great way to finish the cruise. Great, okay. And you've already spoken a bit about the Seine, but did you want to elaborate on some of those destinations? Sure, well, you know, we, we have to mention Paris because Paris is an incredible destination and uh, that's where we start that cruise. Monet's Garden, you know, we, we've seen Monet's paintings so many times, but to see actually firsthand the places that inspired those paintings and see with your own eyes the, the, pretty much the things that he was painting, um, it really is a, a fabulous experience. And just walking around those gardens, they're so beautifully kept and there's a real tranquility about Monet's Garden that uh, really stays with you. Uh, further uh, uh, downstream, we, we hit uh, Rouen. Uh, Rouen, again, is, is a medieval town. Again, a beautiful cathedral. It was one of those places that I hadn't heard a great deal about before I visited. And, and as soon as I'd spent about half an hour there, I knew that I was going to love it. So uh, it's, it, I, I don't want to say too much. You, you just have to go there. It's just a great atmosphere city. And then Enfleur, which is the, the place that I mentioned on the coast. It's so pretty. It's a real sort of French seasidey town. It's colourful, it's vibrant. There's lots of nice little food stalls. You can treat yourself to some oysters if you're that way inclined. Great place to spend the day. Amazing. Now, you also sail in the Netherlands, I know. Um, can you tell us a bit about the destinations that customer could visit if they're choosing a Netherlands cruise? Yeah, so we visit the Netherlands during the springtime, and that's for the fairly obvious reason that it's, it's ball fields, uh, and so that seeing the tulips in full bloom uh, around Kirkenhof, and, and I mean more generally around the Netherlands at that time of year, it's it's something that a lot of people have on their big list of things that they want to see and experience firsthand. So um, we we do that sort of uh, during the month of uh, April essentially. But then away from the ball fields, we visit some really nice towns in Belgium. So. Antwerp, Bruges, Ghent, these are all towns that are just absolutely fabulous. Our customers absolutely love them. So they go for the ball fields, but uh, they take away the memories from these Belgian towns that uh, they perhaps wouldn't have visited if it wasn't for these cruises. Yeah, interesting opportunities there. Okay, so that's Europe. Um, now, can you tell us about the worldwide river cruises and um, which, which, which rivers are you operating on um, outside of Europe? So we've got two at the moment. So we operate on the Mekong, which is uh, in Vietnam and Cambodia. 
So it's a very different proposition to, to our European river cruises. The ships are, are smaller. Obviously, the, the, the scenery is incredibly different and the sorts of places that you're visiting are incredibly different. So they, they have the, the commonality in that you're on a, a beautiful floating hotel and, and visiting place to place. But other than that, it's quite a different experience. So, for example, on the Mekong, we visit a town called Kai B, uh, which has a floating market. You just feel like you're in a completely different world. It's fabulous. And, of course, we go to the uh, the capital of Cambodia, Phnom Penh. Uh, you may have seen it on Race Across the World uh, recently, which I think it was on last week's uh, show. Um, it's a great city that, that uh, combines, obviously, interesting history with various things with Khmer Rouge, etc., but it's, it's modernized quite nicely, but it's re- retains some of that real sort of traditional villagey style stuff. And there's a lot of like street food stores where you can get yourself a nice little snack and, you know, re- real great place to have a little bit of a wander around. And, and like I say, the history around that place, it, it's fascinating. It's not always comfortable, but it is fascinating. And then uh, outside of the Mekong, the, the other river that we operate on is the mighty Nile. So probably needs no real introduction from me, but um we, we sail all the way from Cairo uh, down to Aswan. So we're one of the few operators that does that long cruise all the way from Cairo down to Aswan. So it's a, it's a nice little thing that our customers come to us for because they can do that full uh, experience with us. And, you know, you, you've, you've probably studied uh, uh, Egypt as a kid. I know I did. Uh, a, a lot of people do. And so you've, you've got that whole mystique of, of Tutankhamun's tomb. But uh, the temples of Karnak and Kamombo, there's so much there and every day is a new discovery and you know, there's, you, you, you've, you've seen things on the on the uh, TV like Death on the Nile and things like that. You'll recognise things as, as as you go along and yeah, it's, it's a bit like being in a, in a film or something. It really is a bit special. Yeah, it certainly is a bucket list trip. Well, it is for me anyway. <laughs> okay, so moving on to your themed cruises. So um, what themes can customers choose from um, and how do the themes tie into the destinations they're visiting? W- would that Netherlands um, cruise count as one of your themed cruises? Uh, we don't actually include that in our themed range as okay. such. Um, so we launched our themed cruises at the, at the end of last year. And so we tie each theme to the, the itinerary that works best to showcase it rather than sort of just crowbarring them anywhere. So, for example, we have our gardens and natural beauty cruise which goes along the Rhone so we've talked about the Ardèche Gorge but we also include extra visits so we visit a lavender museum which of course synonymous with uh, the south of France Uh, the garden uh, in uh, Arles where Van Gogh was inspired to paint some of his work Uh, the uh, beautiful botanic gardens in Lyon so lots of extra little things in there as well as getting all the big hits from our main itinerary as well um, unsurprisingly, food was another thing that our customers said that uh, they, they were really keen to uh, incorporate even more into our holidays. So we, we've got two food themed cruises. One is on the Doro. Now that's brilliant because we've talked about the tapas lunch up in, in Salamanca. We've got port tasting. We've got wine tasting, as I mentioned, Vino Verde, the, the, uh, the Portuguese wine, some of the best in Europe. And then uh, pastel de nata, which I'm sure we've all tried at some point, but uh, having a, an authentic one from a Portuguese person, for some reason it just tastes nicer. So we like that a lot. Uh, and then just as you go through some of these smaller places like Pinal, Regua, we, we visit smaller producers where you get to try the local delicacies as well. So that's a really nice cruise. And um, we do a, a Swiss, uh, Rhine Cruise to Switzerland uh, food version as well. So that starts off up in the mountains, eating uh, mountain macaroni. So uh, have a, a beautiful cast iron pot, very traditional dish. We work our way up through the Black Forest, enjoying Black Forest Gatto and some uh, schnapps, if you're that way inclined. Um, finishing up in Cologne, which of course famous for its uh, chocolate at the Lint Factory. Of course, a few other surprises along the way. Uh, we have a music-themed cruise along the Danube. There's so many great composers that have uh, lived and worked in that area from Mozart, Beethoven, Strauss. They're all represented there. And so we incorporate um, visits to uh, recitals as part of that. We have our string quartet playing on board the ships and the the, uh, works of those artists as well. So lots of ways of tying that in on that cruise. Um, And then we also have a arts themed cruise as well, which goes along the Danube. Um, this is in places like the Schönbrunn Palace, which uh, has got an incredibly vast array of uh, works of art. And that really helps tell the history of the area as well. So it's sort of art and history all in one with that cruise, which I really like. 
Okay, great. That must be really helpful for agents as well when they're client matching uh, for Riviera and knowing what their interests are and being able to pick out the right crews for them. Exactly, yeah. I, I think it helps people who they've got a bit of an interest but don't know they want to go on a river cruise and it helps you tie that through to well if you if you want to you know experience some great food in portugal i've got just the thing for you how about a food themed river cruise and yeah. so people who never really thought about a river cruise before suddenly going oh, yeah okay that's that's something i can get into very handy for switch selling <laughs> yes <laughs> so let's talk about the festive cruises a bit more um where are you going on your festive cruises and, and what makes them so so special so uh, I I always tie my uh, my job that I have now back to a, a single moment back in 2007 when I went on a, a festive river cruise uh, for the first time. And I was very lucky that in the job that I was doing, I was working in, in the call centre and I got an opportunity to go on a, on a fam trip. And I'll tell you what, I went on board and I was immediately hooked. There was just something just so special that captivated me so much about being on a Rhine cruise at Christmas time. It's magical. It really, really is. Whether you're the most Christmassy person in the world or someone who doesn't really mind Christmas. And I'm not the most Christmassy person in the world. But I'll tell you what, when I was on that cruise, I was the most Christmassy person in the world. It was beautiful. The ship is decked out just like a fairy tale. There's gingerbread house sculptures. We have uh, tastings on board of traditional uh, foods. And then you go to the Christmas markets as well. You're there as well. So every day, a different market, another glass of glue vine. You just get your hat and your scarf and your gloves on. You get up all cosy. And every single day is just an absolute joy. So we uh, do festive cruises on the Rhine, going through some parts of Germany. And we also do a Danube one that visits uh, Budapest, uh, Vienna and Bratislava. Okay, great. And what about the other seasons? Are you able to pick out kind of what one sailing or one destination that you'd recommend for, for spring, summer and autumn? So I think for spring, you, your mind just automatically goes to the ball fields in, in uh, the Netherlands. Yeah. It's it, it, it's an absolute classic cruise. You, you get to see those things firsthand and it re really is a, a great way of, of spending your holiday. You know, you, there's something just so um, exciting about spring, you know, bulbs popping up for the first time. You start seeing colours after the long winter. And so it really helps kickstart your, your spring season to go on a ball fields cruise, I think. In terms of summer, uh, I, I think the, the Rhine cruise to Switzerland is a great option because a lot of that cruise is at altitude, so it's a little bit cooler. So the summer months are a really great period to go. And um, al alpine scenery in the middle of summer is something else. You know, it, it's just... Uh, so some of the grandest scenery that you're likely to see and being able to do it with temperatures that are likely to be a little bit more comfortable for you as well so particularly for, if you've got slightly older clientele that probably works well for them and then I think for uh, the autumn I would always say uh, the Rhone so the south of France September October absolutely perfect time to go down there the, the weather's still warm it's not busy around at that time of year so it's a great time to go and see it all um there's just so many nice places to go and it's you know you're, you're walking around in your shorts and t-shirts it's still sort of you know 20 degrees every single day even going into the autumn so uh yeah lo lo lovely time of year to be in that part of the world i think fantastic now we are we are running out of time coming towards the end but i do just want to fit in a question about combination cruises and solo travelers um which cruises they would like so first of all tell us about the combination cruises how because they're new how do they work um, and why they're going to appeal to customers. Yep. So one thing that we've found uh, coming out of COVID was that people wanted to go away for longer, uh, spend a little bit more on their holiday. And so our, our cruises traditionally are seven or 10 nights, a couple of 14 nights, but mostly seven, 10 nights. And people wanted that something a little bit longer. So by combining a, a cruise one that, that goes straight into cruise two and, and creating this combination cruise, uh, we've been able to offer longer uh, durations. So from 14, 17, up to 28 night durations. And the great thing is you're on the same ship. You don't have to change your cabin. So you stay in the same cabin throughout. So you can enjoy a month on board one of our beautiful river cruise ships. Great way of doing it. Fantastic. And what about um, your, your solo river cruises for, for solo travellers? Um, which rivers are they on? Are they on all of them? Um, and what makes them suitable for solos? What, what makes them different? So we're so proud of our solo range of cruises because we take the whole ship and make it exclusively for solo travellers. So everyone gets a full size cabin to themselves and no sharing. And there's so many benefits to that. First of all, it means that everyone on the ship is in the same situation as you. You don't have to feel like a third wheel, like a gooseberry or anything like that. 
everyone on on there is on there as a solo traveler so immediately breaks down all the barriers just makes you feel so much more comfortable another great advantage is we still have the exact same amount of crew the same amount of space so it means that you're getting twice as many crew uh, per passenger so a really really good experience from that side of things plenty of room in the lounge plenty of room on the sun deck so you know the, the ship's got half as many people on so it's just a bit more of an exclusive atmosphere and we, we have our solo cruises now available on pretty much every single river that we operate. And as I say, we're, we're really proud of, of what we're offering to our, our, our solo travellers. And, uh, you know, we're, we're only looking to do more going forward. Yeah, it's brilliant. Really interesting to hear. OK, thank you. 